Welcome to the Heroic Tie series. I'm Jeff with the Halcyon Masters, and we have a special episode for you today. We will connect all of your favorite heroes from across the Vainglory world. To add a special twist, we will connect them by the land and the region of their origin. Let's hit the intro. The Old World is where we begin our journey. This is home to Rona and Fortress. Fortress is the guardian of a temple which surrounds a Halcyon well. The temple is overrun by the Churn, and after narrowly escaping, Fortress called for his friend the Druid. The Druid happens to also be Rona's teacher. In his final instruction, he tasks Rona to lead her people away to safety, while he would journey to the other side of the world to seek help. Rona, being a stubborn berserker, ignored the Druid and tracked him north, braving the elements and those wicked demon rabbit. I crossed the donkey bridge. The druid opened a passageway to the Halcyon Fold. Under the influence of some powerful psychedelic acorns, he bartered his life to the great oak tree, so that his companions could make the trip. Silly tree. Fortress entered first, followed by Rona. On the other side, Fortress confided in Rona that the druid knew that she would follow and join the fight. Another hero who is rumored to have originated from the Old World is Cruel. We know he seeks the power of the Halcyon to end his immortal suffering, but due to his old age, senality, and countless blows to the head, he's forgot where he's from. Yes. Moving from the Old World to another distant land is where we meet Idris and Adagio. Idris and his people are from the Shimmer, a beautiful desert that was once a magnificent glass mountain. The mountain was destroyed in the battle between the Elder Dragons and the Seraphims. From its ashes rose the glass city, fueled by the largest source of Halcyon in the world known as the Great Well. The city was so beautiful that it attracted the attention of Adagio himself. It was a special place for the Seraphim. After countless generations, he grew bored with the trivial nature of humans and lesser beings. The beauty of the city was different, until its own destruction. The city was lost, overrun by wild jungle and horrific peace. Idris and his people now live in a refugee camp outside the city. Detecting Adagio on a distant sand dune, Idris blinked himself next to the Seraphim and requested his help. Impressed by Idris' blink, Adagio chose to speak to the human. His words didn't really help Idris as much as give him hope that somewhere in the city was a book that outlined how to hold back the churn with the use of technology. Idris blinked into the city on a suicide mission fought a pair of pissed off churn sisters and acquired the ancient text. While in the city, he was exposed to the churn and corrupted. Fighting the churn's call, Idris blinked once again to the dune outside the city and collapsed at the feet of Adagio. The Seraphim must have felt generous and slightly impressed that Idris recovered the book, so he gave him his gift of fire to hold back the effect of the churn. Recovering the book was only the first step towards saving his people. Idris must seek help from the people who know how to build the devices outlined in the text. To find the technologist, he must travel to the Halcyon Fold. While the Shimmer is a desert, the Peninsula is a land with no shortage of water. This is also home to our star-crossed lovers, Skye and Baron. The two are childhood friends, but come from very different families. Baron is the heir to a crystal fortune, while Skye is the general's daughter. On the peninsula, marriages are arranged, and the most eligible bachelor is Baron. Still handsome. Before the arrangement ceremony, Baron and Sky met on a balcony. They discussed the country's reliance on the crystal, and the wars fought over its power. Baron revealed Sky's tile in his hand and told her, Sometimes, despite everything, a man must choose for himself. This gave Sky hope that they would marry. Back in the ceremony, Baron's mom announced that Nari from Tiger House would be her son's bride. The arrangement was political and to prevent war between Tiger and Silverhouse. Hearing the announcement, Skye's heart sank as her name would not be called for Baron or for anyone else. He took her tile off so that she would be free to be his general, not his wife. Baron made his decision, so Skye made hers. She would free both of them from their family's obligations by destroying the crystal mines. She suited up and unleashed a lot of crazy girl anger on the source of Baron's wealth. I know what I'm doing. Baron chased after her in his own suit of armor. The two had a heated lover's quarrel, bombing each other with ion cannons and Surrey strikes. Battered and bruised, the two kissed and made up. After surveying the damage, they left for the Halcyon Fold to recharge the crystals they had just destroyed. Sky and Baron are not the only heroes from the peninsula. 
It is also the home to the mysterious and adorable baby dragon scarf. Rumors of a fire-breathing monster spread like wildfire across the lands. Legend predicts that he will dominate the world as an adult, and where better to start world domination than the Halcyon Fold? Not far from the peninsula are the Scattered Islands. This is home to Taka and Gwen. Taka grew up studying the martial arts but was later brainwashed into killing his teacher by Maza, the leader of House Kamuha. The pain of killing his Shisho snapped Taka from Maza's grip long enough for him to escape and seek the therapy he desperately requires. Some therapists will suggest facing your fears, and while Gwen is no therapist, she leads Taka right back to Maza. Using Taka as bait, Gwen defeats Maza with a well-placed shot through the eye. Right snap through the eye. With House Kamuha out of the picture, the two are free to continue their adventures on the fold. Now this way to adventure. Speaking of adventure, there's no better duo than Blackfeather and Finn. I'm guilty by association. Their adventure begin in the Evertides, the same continent as the Halcyon Fold. Blackfeather hatches a grand plan to kidnap Princess Maline and return her for a hefty bounty. The caper does not go exactly to plan when Blackfeather is surprised that the princess wants to be kidnapped. Once out of the castle, Blackfeather and Finn are confronted by a band of ruffians. During their escape, the princess is pricked by a hardy orange thorn, which puts her into a coma. It turns out kissing an unconscious princess is not only creepy, but it does not wake them up. Only the tickle of a seraphin feather will do the trick, and blue ones happen to work best. Well, we all know where we can find a blue seraphin feather. Moving along, Githia is home to Lyra, Samuel, Rhyme, Grace, Laura, and Reza. The heroes are all interconnected and it begins with Grace. At the age of six, her father took her on an expedition where they encountered a mage-born boy by the name of Reza. Grace and her father abducted, I mean adopted him, so that he could study with the mages back in Githia. Grace also changed his name to Titus. Years later, Titus and Lyra became lovers, and planned to be married. Unfortunately, their application was denied, and Lyra was shipped off to settle the frozen wasteland known as Trostan. Lyra successfully established the colony, and she gets word that a replacement would be sent so she could return to Githia. In a cruel twist, her replacement is Laura's four-year-old son Samuel, whose father is none other than Lyra's former lover Titus. Lyra must remain in Trostan for another 14 years, raising the son that she was denied and preparing him for the task of governing the Providence. Samuel studied under Lyra, the Grangors, and convinced Rhyme to take him as a student so he could prepare for the 10th Mage Discipline, a test Rhyme's own son did not survive. The colony of Trostan is located at the base of the Cal Peaks. It's home of the Grangors and a large deposit of crystals. Early attempts to settle the area resulted in attacks by the cat-like people. In one raid, they killed everyone in the human village except for one little girl. More on her later. Back to Samuel. Nearing the time of his final test, Samuel received instructions from his biological mother Laura to take the 10th discipline, then return to Trostan and relocate the Grangor people so they could expand Githia's mining efforts. Samuel rebelled against his mother's instructions and led the Grangors in the destruction of Trostan. He fled the land and seeked passage on the wandering islands known as the Archelian. This is where Samuel was befriended by Lance. Trained by Gennaro, the late Githian knight and friend of Grace's father, Lance inherited his armor so that he could one day serve Githia. That day came when Samuel sailed home. Upon Samuel's return, he was escorted to the test of the 10th discipline. Embarrassed by Samuel's actions and blinded by her singular focus to return Githia to power, Laura planned to have her son killed during the trial, just as she had done with Rhyme's son. Samuel outsmarts his mother by opening a portal to the netherworld. He takes her wand and just before he can deliver a killing blow, Lance steps in and blocks the attack. Samuel escapes and heads to the Halcyon Fold where he plans to confront his mother's backup plan, Celeste. The Githian story comes full circle as Lance searches for Samuel. He arrives at the Paladin's Gate and details the event of the trial to Grace. She rewards his bravery by knighting him Sir Lance. He's dismissed and Grace sets off to find her brother Titus. Ah, Grace. Have you come to punish me for imbibing a cheap wine and expensive women? On the contrary, brother. Your son needs you. 
Grace reasons with Titus's parental instinct and convinces him to help his son by unleashing his demon form, Reza. Burning things down really runs in the family. While knights stand for honor, there's a city where the less refined reside. New Aurelium is in close proximity to the Halcyon Fold, and in the city's lower quarter is home to our resourceful orphan Jewel. Hungry and tired of being kicked around, Jewel executes a masterful heist. Using misdirection, guerrilla tactics, and a noxious fart to secure the prototype battle map. Part of New Aurelium is known as the Undersprawl. This happens to be Ringo's favorite hangout spot. Hurry, I gotta get back to the Undersprawl. He used to be one of the most famous carnies, as he could shoot the center from multiple coins tossed in the air, even drunk off his butt. The only thing more destructive than Ringo's drinking habit was his gambling problems. Ringo insults a blind Grangor by the name of Glaive, then enters into a wager where he bets his sidearm. Ringo took this wager to mean his gun. Glaive's definition of sidearm was a little more literal. I'll give you one guess on who won that wager. <laughs> An acceptable trophy. Another famous carny is the one and only Ozo, a ring-toting, fast-talking, and free-spirited monkey who dominates the big top with his acrobatic moves. His free spirit is the foundation of a friendship with the fun-loving and borderline sociopathic cat girl Kashka. Earlier I mentioned we would return to Kashka, and now is that time. A band of Grangors raided a human village, but spared one of the children. They raised her as one of their own until she left the nest as a teenager to discover herself. Kashka finds her way to the forest near the Halcyon Fold and discovers a scout trap. Enamored with its flashing lights and shininess, she knows that she has to share in her discovery. She stalks Cruel, surprises Adagio, and comes across an unusual bouncing creature by the name of Petal. Petal belongs to the group known as the Mikos, and the forest has two main populations, the Mikos and the Blikos. <laughs> the two races have been at war for as long as either group can remember. I hate vegetables, so that's all I eat. The Mikos thrive in the sun and live to grow their sentient gardens, while the Blikos move in the shadow and consider themselves superior because of science and culture. Have I told you about my master's thesis? On the front lines of their border war are our heroes Petal and Flicker. Petal is an explorer who's one of the first to leave the garden. This is gonna be great! While Flicker is a scientist who seeks to study the enemy and their source of power. While Flicker studies his enemy, Saw gets his education firsthand as a soldier. His training and conditioning regiment served him well as he survived his time in the service and has now put in his papers for discharge. He was in the army so long that wherever home was, it is no longer. This makes Saw one of our nomadic heroes. While he can always try to get out of the fight, it seems to pull him back in, and this time in a big way. In a port town, a massive leviathan emerged from the bay. Unable to run from a fight, Saw grabbed a gun from a downed airship and went Rambo on the monster. After the battle, Saw flew away holding onto the ladder, suspended from an airship, and is now picking another fight on the Halcyon Fold, along with taking out one mayor along the way. On the opposite side of the Halcyon Fold is the Evertides, and it is controlled by the Storm Queen and is the dominant power on the main continent. While the Storm Queen rules from Mount Lily, her tyrannical grasp on the land has created a lot of discontent, and some of the regions have stayed independent, such as the Taizan Gate. To tell the story of the Evertides, we have to go back about 14 years. The Storm Queen had a sister, Julia, who was rumored to be dead after the Great War, but Julia was alive and married to Arden. Together, they were living in a simple home in southern Githia, with their two mage-born children, Vox and Celeste. The Storm Queen's spies, likely Vin, discovered Julia and the twins, then ordered Catherine, captain of the Storm Guard, to bring them back to Mount Lily. The plan was to train Vox to lead her fleet and to mold Celeste into her successor. The night before the operation, Catherine met Julia in secret to inform her of the Storm Queen's command. Seeing no other option, Julia asked Catherine to do the impossible. She asked her to take her life during the raid, as a mage is the most powerful at the time of their death. The day of the raid, Julia brought home a female goat for the children. It screamed and screamed all evening. Inside the house, Julia and Arden argued over the goat, 
While outside, Catherine instructed the storm guard to make a perimeter. Kestrel took position in a tree that overlooked the house. Each scream of the goat wore on Kestrel's nerves until she let an arrow fly. That's enough. Swiftly ending the goat's life. The silence outside alerted Arden and Julia. He raced to put on his power armor, but the massive blast tremor from Catherine froze him in place. Catherine walked over to Julia and instructed the other storm guard to collect the children. Arden had to watch as Catherine drove her sword into his wife's chest. With Julia's last breath, she empowered Arden with the strength to knock out the other storm guard and escape the blockade around the house. Arden escaped to the Taizan Gate, where he raised his children in secret. Torn from her decisions, Catherine abandoned the Storm Guard and went into hiding in the Northern Territories. She was able to elude the Storm Queen and the rest of the Guard for years, but eventually they found her in the Northern Providences, working as a mercenary. The Storm Guard confronted Catherine for breaking her oath. The tables turned when Catherine convinced them that she never broke her oath to the Guard, just to the Storm Queen, and that they needed to be loyal to one another. In a coup d'etat, a majority of the Storm Guard left the Queen's service. They made their way to the Taizan Gate where it was rumored that Arden, Vox, and Celeste were hiding. The rumors were true, and it happened to be a good place to hide, because after the Great War, the Taizan Gate stayed independent. The twins were discovered because in their ultimate wisdom, they decided to throw a rave. Vox provided the beats, while Celeste used her control of the stars to create one hell of a light show. The rave was too successful as it attracted the attention of the Githians, now the independent Storm Guard, and the Storm Queen herself. Celeste and Vox almost fell to their death, but was saved at the last minute by their father. Burned by the Storm Guard's betrayal, the Storm Queen commissioned Frankie to build the perfect replacement. It happened that one of the Storm Guard by the name of Daisy was defending a Halcyon well. It did not end well for poor Daisy, as Cruel sieged the well and threw her body down the hole. Buffering. Buffering. Target zero, zero, one. Storm guard. Exterminate. Frankie recovered her body and turned her into the perfect killing machine we all know as Alpha. In a grand battle at the top of an air tower, Catherine realized Alpha is Daisy. Trying to reason with the unstoppable robot created an error in Alpha's programming and allowed Daisy to temporarily regain control and self-destruct. With Alpha now broken, the Storm Queen took out her frustrations on Frankie and locked him in prison. Frankie happens to be a genius, and no prison can realistically detain him. Using a time machine and the promise of cheesecake, he recruited a creature by the name of Grumpjaw, and the two escaped the maximum security prison. Also in the Evertides is a city known as Crescent City. The Storm Queen's oppressive rule sparked dissidents across her subjects. Their common voice willed a spirit into existence. His name is Batiste, and in a land where magic is outlawed, he is the embodiment of it. Papa Batiste is the culmination of the discontent in the Evertides, and his purpose is to end the reign of queens. Before we end this episode, there is one more creature wandering the lands of Southern Githia. It is the nightmare goat known as Corpus. She stalks the land, horrifying anyone in the way of finding who shot the arrow. Kestrel should watch out, both in life and in her dreams. Is that all? Really? Thanks for watching. This was a really fun video to produce. I want to say thanks to Sugar Venom, Playoff Beard, and the rest of the team at SEMC for the amazing backstory. To anyone watching this, I have one request. Press the like and subscribe button. Subscriptions directly help this channel, and it also lets you know when we release a new video. I would really love to hit 10,000 subs, and to see if we can break my previous record of over a thousand likes. We also love to read your comments. Let me know what story you want to hear next, and your thought on this video specifically. Until next time, we'll see you on the Halcyon Fold.